Joining me now on the Knicks Film School podcast, this is someone that um, I've certainly spent. No, Jer- I've spent more time podcasting with Jeremy Cohen over the last year and change than this person. But he's I think you're a close second. Um, I'm up there, man. You're you're right there. Um, he is uh, he provides words, thoughts, um, uh, takes um, hot and cold in between. Um, everything you could possibly want for Celtics blog, um, which of course we're talking to him today because um, the season is coming down the wire and uh, the Knicks and the Celtics are, I don't know. I think there, there, there's a conversation here. I think we need to have a conversation about the Knicks and the Celtics. Um, so Adam Taylor, um, welcome to, what is it? Is this your, th- no, I was going to say, is this your second or third time on this podcast? I've been on uh, yours twice, yeah. I think. I think this is number two for me. This is number two for you. And then obviously yeah. we, we've had multiple podcasts. To do <laughs> <laughs> for anybody who doesn't know, we, we hosted, uh, it was hoop spy at first and then it went over to talk basket. And then we, then we um, retired that as, as things got a little, a little too crazy. Um, but why not, why not shoot the shit? Because I've got Adam. some takes off those shows that um, came to fruition. Did you, do, oh my God! Do you still have our over unders for before the season? Uh, I can find them. Well, I did, well, I should, probably should have told you that about that beforehand. I think my gut feeling uh, or my 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 recollection is that whatever my take on the Celtics was is that it was lukewarm. Like I was like, I don't feel strongly about the over or the under. Um, I was a strong over on the Knicks, so that that is on record somewhere out there in the ether. You were over on the Knicks too. I've been more high on the Knicks than pretty me, much most yeah. Knicks fans. No, yeah. you you have been. And what were you? I'm trying to remember. What was your take on the Celtics before the season even started? Second round exit. Okay. All right. So that's reasonable. Yeah, I was trying to be as um, honest as possible. <laughs> well, you didn't know how honest you were. Um, <laughs> so uh, let's 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 set the stage here. So we are recording this as 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 I live and breathe. It is 3.40 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Wednesday, May 12th. So when when, pe- when folks are hearing this, it's going to be um, Friday. So a few things will have happened between now and when folks are listening to this. The Celtics will have played a game in Cleveland against the Cavaliers of Cleveland, which will be a game that Jalen Brown is not playing in. Kemba Walker does not, has not played in. Marcus Smart has not played in. Robert Williams has not played in. Um, did I miss anybody? Fast and loose with the name Celtics right now. It's just um, some players contracted to Boston will be taking part in a scrimmage against Cleveland. I don't even know who's playing for the Cavs. I think the Cavs are tr- trotting out their usual complement of. Uh, yeah, that's why, know, it's <laughs> that's why it's a scrimmage. That's why it's a scrimmage. So. Um, again, the, the, there is a chance that when you're listening to this, the, by virtue of the Celtics potentially losing that game, the Knicks will have already, um, clinched the playoff spot because of that. And then of course the Knicks play on uh, Thursday night against the San Antonio Spurs. So there's actually multiple opportunities. Um, and, and of course, all of this is leading up to the final game of the season in which the Knicks and the Celtics play, um, maybe with everything on the line, maybe with nothing on the line, maybe with, um, you know, just playoff positioning on the line uh, that remains to be seen. Um, but I wanted to talk to you because whatever, whatever is going to happen with the games is going to happen over the next several days. I just think it's just, it's fascinating. We went into this year and I talk about people who are high on other teams. How high was I on Jason Tatum? I'm pretty sure that you had him like ending the season as like a top five, top eight guy. I I think when we did our whatever silly rankings we did about like most valuable trade assets or what one of the, our podcasts, I had I had I had him second to Luca, right? In terms of guys like under a certain age, I think it was top top fifteen or top five under twenty five, or we did some. Uh, some or top like thirteen that. under twenty three, somewhat ridiculous that just gave us something to talk about. But I had I had Tatum second, and you know how I think about the the sport and team building, and how much value I place on like, all right, if you have that guy, nothing else fucking matters because if you have the guy, you can figure out all the other shit. Um, 
Well, unless maybe you have Kristaps Porzingis on your team, but that's a topic for a different day. Um, no, sh- no, 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 you don't like the shade, the Dallas shade. I mean, I like the shade. I like the shade. I just, uh, I, f- I saw you in train of thought. I was allowing you, and I always make the same joke with Chris Stubbs anyway about being beat up in Lithuania. So uh, it's played, it's played out. <laughs> it's not played out. It'll never be played out. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I was very, I was very high in the Celtics before the season, mostly because of Tatum, but also because you know, um, Brown, Brad, Brad Stevens. I was, I, I was, did not expect this from Brown, but he's had obviously a great year. Um, and, and the Knicks were, we were like, okay, are they going to be this, this spunky story, uh, you know, where they win a, f- a handful more games than they, than they're allotted to win. Um, and now we're sitting here and I, I guess I'll just start by asking you, it feels from afar that the feeling in Boston or around the Celtics or covering the Celtics, obviously you're not in Boston, but is that like the sky is falling? So let, let's start there. Is, is, is the sky falling? The or, sky or, fell. A it's, while it's, back. it's gone. Okay. Yeah, it's gone. There's no sky. We're just staring <laughs> up at empty, empty space at this point. <laughs> is it black? Is it white? Is it gray? I mean, it's, it's, just, it's just non-existent. There's just a nothingness above us and we can <laughs> feel it closing in. It's like the singularity in reverse. Um, seriously though, like, yeah, it does. And, uh, what shocked me to be quite honest is how quickly everybody turned on Brad Stevens. Oh my God. Yeah. And how vocal that crowd has been for months at this point. Like, um, it's to the point where I actually had to start taking like days off social media because no matter where you turned, it was fire Brad Stevens, Brad, this Brad, that. And I'm just like, this is like the most insane season anyway. Like nothing, people haven't been put in a position to be successful from the get-go and teams that are successful have just figured out how to navigate this year better than other teams have figured out how to navigate this year. Um, So to me, that's the craziest outcome of this whole year is the fire Brad Stevens narrative. But yeah, there's definitely no sky. The sky's gone. It's just, it's so interesting to me. Like, because before the season started, I think there was a a vocal minority, but still a minority of people in the general NBA landscape who were in the camp of like, Danny Ainge is overrated. I'm, t- I'm sick and tired of hearing about the trades that Danny Ainge didn't make. He has a shitty drafting record. The Celtics are overrated generally. But I think more like the majority of, of national opinion out there about the Celtics was that like, they're one of the premier organizations in the league because of, I mean, they, it's been how many conference finals with, with Tatum? It's uh, two. I think uh, three, if I'm not mistaken. Is it three? Okay. Yeah. And and, but second round appearances and like the whole, the whole, the whole thing. Oh yeah. Wait, they made it to the, yeah, they made it to the conference finals last year. Yeah, three conference finals. Three conference finals. Shit, my God. So, like, again, sitting here from from my chair, where the Knicks have not made the conference finals <laughs> since, <laughs> since I was since I was a teenager, um, and I'm really fucking old. Uh, you know, it's like I think that's a nice accomplishment. And then you and then you look at the are they doing this with like older vets who aren't going to be around anymore? Are they doing this like no? They're doing this with with Tatum and Brown and like so. It's just amazing to me how quickly that narrative can change. And now it's like, is it fucking Ainge? Is it Stevens? Is Tatum like a selfish player? And they're never like, where where do you, how do you, you're covering this team. How do you go about making, and then we'll relate it to the Knicks in a second, because that's the other side of the coin, how it could flip the other way. How do you, how do you go about making heads or tails of like what's happened? Uh, Honestly, I have to splash water in my face. Uh, take a look in the mirror. No, seriously, yeah. take a look in the mirror and kind of just be like, look at this objectively. Look at it for, for what it is. Uh, a shortened season where every team has had their struggles. Um, then you've got, you have like, okay, so Tatum's missed time. Brown's missed time. Brown gets shut down for the season. Rob Williams, as Rob, in true Rob Williams fashion, in and out of the season. All oh, the come on. Don't, don't be harsh. On Time Lord, we, we it's true, dude. You, you know I'm a Time Lord fan. I'm a big Time Lord fan. But I know you are. Day, you, I know you are. You, you're 
the best, uh, what was it? The Brad Steve best ability is, is, is availability. Mm. And that's yeah. true to a big extent. I think for me, like, um, I'm very happy with the draft prospects that we bought in, in terms of Peyton Pritchard and Aaron Neesmith. Yeah, I was about to say, Nesmith, Nesmith, I was watching him. What was it? The, where is it? The Spurs game where he was raining hellfire and, and, uh, yeah, dude. he's just yeah. insane. He just yeah. likes to throw his body everywhere, dude. Yeah. Um, Honestly, for me, I think it's been very much a disjointed roster, very top heavy. It was con- it was constructed to have high level talent at the top end of the roster yeah. and then a sheer drop towards absolute obscurity once you got past like the seventh man on that rest- on that rotation. And then you 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 know, it's not an excuse. A lot of teams have been through this. Uh you have your COVID issues, you have your general injuries. And when you don't have the back at the talent at the back end of that rotation, uh, there's not much you can really do about it. Everything, it's not going to work out very well when you're relying on Grant Williams to play um, power forward and he cannot defend a power forward to save his life. Um, so, yes. nah, dude, he gets blown by so much. He's a small ball five and he's stuck in that. Yeah. He's kind of, he's, he's not quick enough to be a four and he's not big enough to be a five. So he's in that tweener zone and he just hasn't figured out how to exist there at the moment. Um, For me, it's just going to be, it's going to go down as a bad season. Uh, If I'm going to blame anyone, I've kind of said that I'm putting uh, 50% on Danny Ainge and then 30% on the team, 20% on Stevens, because you can only coach what you've got. Yeah. A lot of this has been effort related. Uh, to team just giving up or not putting in a, a decent shift as you will, you know. And uh, for me, that's I get the head coach is meant to motivate, but at the same time, you're getting paid 30, 20, 10, 5 million dollars a year. You should be motivated anyway, man. Well, yeah, but hold on on that because so relating this to the Knicks, it the Knicks have had good player, they haven't had a Jason Tatum level building block over the last. 20, well, I mean, at that age, they really haven't had Jason Tatum level building blocks since, since Ewing was young because obviously Mello was already, um, what was he, 26, 27 when we got him. Um, so, but they've had talent, and you you look at the teams over the and whether it's because of organizational dysfunction or that combined with, you know, coaching and just like GM and coach not being on the same timeline or all any of this shit, it's like, we, we could constantly point to year after year after year of like whatever the Knicks are doing, it just wasn't working. Like the the, the, the whole was less than the sum of the parts, right? That, uh, did I get that right? I think I got that right. Um, <laughs> you're laughing at me. Um, the whole was less than, always the whole was less than some of the parts. And this year has been, the, if, if, if like there's a lot of euphemisms and things you could throw around about what this Knicks season has has really meant and and how we will remember it. For me, I'm looking at it as like, not so much that Thibodeau has maxed out each of the players on the roster. It's that he has figured out how to make the players on the roster fit cohesively at both ends of the floor to the point that now when you sit and watch a Nick game, I can see, I can say, I know what I'm going to see and say, it's going to be Nick's basketball. And I don't mean that in a derogatory way where I'm, I'm making a joke. So, and, and so let's get back to the Celtics. The talent is there. I don't think Tatum's an unselfish player at the top. I just went and looked at his assist totals over his last six, seven games. He's averaging like five, six, seven assists over that time. Or, you know, it, so we're, and I keep hearing like they don't play make. There's no, there's no flow to the offense. Like who that has to fall on somebody. Yeah. And that's definitely falls on Stevens. As far as I'm concerned, like um, I will say like Tatum's playmaking has improved, but it's forced. They're definitely trying to develop that from him. Uh, for me, okay. A lot of the and so he's not generating offense for others. He it's more like they're feeding. He's feeding that offense through okay. just by virtue of being the most high usage guy. He's that's the, it. Okay. one of the predominant ball handlers. Yeah, and that's, that's been fair. the issue with Kemba Walker all year. Kemba's having to learn to be this third option on a team and pr- operate far more off ball than what he's ever had to before. And there's been some teething issues there. The offense is slow. Tatum as a player. Um, kind of like his personality, he's very much, he'll do everything in his own time. You're not rushing him, but that affects tempo. 
because he where you want um when this team's at its best it's sprinting the floor and it's like they did against Miami um yesterday they the, ran the, the, they, the second Miami game where yeah. they were that, that was a great it was a, right in that game for three quarters for three quarters but if yeah. you look at it and you look at like when the ball's in Kemba's hands or Pritchard's hands and the speed of getting up and getting into that set and actually being in an offensive motion and then watch when the ball hits Tatum's hands and how long it takes to get w- into that same motion. There's a huge okay. disparity. Um, the other That's thing that well, reminds me a lot like Mello during the later. Yeah. I've no. kind of said it, it reminds me a bit of Mello. I will say a lot of his assists as well are um, bailout passes. Like he'll drain 12 to 14 seconds off that clock. Okay. Um in an ISO or just trying to break somebody down off the dribble when he realizes shit, it's not working. That's when he'll hit the pass. So I'd say like if he gets seven, three or four of them will be, uh, he got lucky. He, he just found the right man at the right yeah. time. It wasn't like they've, he's created that assist. And, and if you're a, if you're a wing player, a guard or a wing, um, or in, I guess, or Julius Randle, but although, his, but Julius Randle is different because his assists are like, he's generating offense. Um, but like for like for instance, RJ Barrett, RJ Barrett's averaging over three assists a game. I've watched all of his assists this year. Some of them excellent. He's actually b- made leaps and bounds as a playmaker. But you could go back and look at his assists over the first half of the season, and there wasn't a ton where he's like the one really generating the offense. He's benefiting from like the balls in his hands because he's in the game a lot, and he's going to just pass it to the guy next to him, and the guy's going to you know hit a three or whatever. So yeah, different different type of assists. I, I hear you. Yeah, and I will say like he's a his understanding of when to make those passes, um, like recognition, like that game recognition has improved a bunch this year just because he's had to do that. But for me, like um, it's been, this year was for me personally, and I said this on my podcast uh, back in the off season, was always going to be a development year. You knew that you had to put Kemba in an off-ball position because his knees just wouldn't be able to take the usage rate. Um, And I think he's kind of disproved that somewhat over the last few weeks, but you know, he's, he hasn't played back-to-backs all year, so there's no rhythm. And for me... I mean, Brad's, as we're recording this, he's got 30 points in three of his last four games, and he's shooting the, the lights out of the ball. Yeah, he's been excellent, absolutely outstanding. Uh, but there's been stretches where he's gone one for 13 from deep in the game. Yeah. And so, you know, it, it's took him a while to get back to where he is. For me, it's just all been about Brad Stevens not figuring out what pieces of the puzzle go where. But it's also been about Brad, Danny Ainge giving Brad Stevens the wrong shape pieces for the well, puzzle. OK, so let's I because here's why this is fa- it's fascinating to me from a narrative perspective, which we, we talked about already. It's also fascinating to me from a team building perspective, because like. If you looked at the Knicks roster before the season, if anybody told you by, that by the end of the season that anyone would have said like, oh, my God, you know, they really got the right mix of guys for Tom Thibodeau. If someone said that before the year, it would have been fucking insane. You would have, you would have been putting a, a loony bit. <laughs> this they is were- where Brad Stevens hates coming from. No, but like but, but the right mix of guys, like they got it's a scrap heap of guys. Like these yep. guys, you know what right mix? Like, but but yet yeah, now we look at it and it's like, oh, perfect. Reggie Bullock flies around, quick release. He's your he's your deep ball threat. You know, R.J. Barrett picks up a little of the secondary, um, you know, playmaking responsibilities during you know, in the, whether he's with the starters, with the subs, like Derrick Rose. He's essentially now their second engine to Julius, and then Randall being what Randall's become. Like all these guys have their role. You know, the centers to, to a man, whether it's Mitch, um, Noel, Taz, like they know what they're doing, like they and they do what they're supposed to do. Like everybody plays their role and and Tibbs has made it work. But yet for me, to, I, I, what am I going to am I sitting here and I'm saying that Tom Thibodeau is now suddenly an eminently better coach than Brad Stevens? Because that doesn't seem accurate. Like it's so. But so I guess my point is to go back to what you said, like, what were there really? Like these are, do these supporting pieces matter that much? I guess they do. If I'm, if I'm hearing you correctly. Yeah. For me, it's like everyone looks at Jason Tatum and Jalen Brown as these like all stars. And it's easy to think these guys are finished products and Mm. they're, they're super consistent and they're just not that yet. Um, They have spurts of consistency, but then you also have spurts where Jason Tatum averages 12 points and he's shooting 38% from the field overall. Um, so 
I don't think if these two guys were at their peak in terms of they figured out how to be consistent, mm. like the best way to look at it is like if you talk about a bad game for James Harden or Kawhi or whoever, a bad game is like you still open up the box score and they got 20, 25, 30 points and you're like, but they played like trash. If I say yeah. Jason Tatum had a bad game and I opened up the butt score, we're looking at like 14 on like well, one of 17 shooting. So that's where he didn't get to yet because Harden, I know he's been out forever, but like Harden's one of those guys, like the literally the worst Harden game, he's still helping his team. In regular season games, playoff games, maybe we could have a different conversation, but like how many guys are really in that category? It's Harden, it's LeBron, it's Doncic now. Um, KD's got to be in there. Okay, yeah, KD for sure. Kawhi, um, Steph, yeah, Ka- Kawhi, yeah, but Kawhi. See, to me, Kawhi is the apex version of where it seems like Tatum is headed, as opposed, because like to me, Tatum is not, he's not headed on the Doncic path, because Doncic, mm-hmm. it's like he he just makes life easier for everybody around, no matter what the hell he's doing. He can go, yeah eight for for 25 and he, the team is going to be massively better because of his presence. Whereas Tatum, if he, if he has that sort of game, it's not. So I think to, to me, I put Kawhi kind of in this different, I think the difference with Kawhi is Kawhi has so few terrible games, except he's in a bit of a slump now, but like, I don't know. I think the list is like, unless I'm forgetting, I think the list is like five players long. Um, and bead kind of in his own weird way, I guess. Giannis, Giannis, possibly. Yo, yo, oh my God! How can we forget, Mike? Jesus Christ! We'll talk about. <laughs> you see, um, I think there's. I think yeah, if, you no, look at any team, if you look at any team with true Chris Paul's another guy who could. Fit oh, in and that Jimmy Butler. So yeah. I think that's. I think we just now named, and then like Dame. So maybe like there's like ten guys. Yeah, that's but it. if you look at any team that's in a championship contention window, they have one of those. They 10 have guys. one of those guys. Yeah, and I think that everybody sees this from Tatum. They see the sixty point scoring nights. They see the fact that he's a two time All Star now. And that's expected of him. When you've got a player like that, I do believe that your role players become less impactful towards winning. Uh, But right now, when you're kind of, you don't know what type of performance you're getting from your primary offense, Mm -hmm. those role role players, in my opinion, hold much more value because you just don't know if Tatum's having a rough night, you need someone coming off the bench to kind of shore it all up. Um, Yeah, like Randall... It's interesting because, like, on Randall's bad nights, I'm not going to say he's still, like, there's been a few times this year where he's, like, not helped the team. I could count them on one hand, and I'll have fingers left over. Like, even his bad shooting nights, he's still figuring out ways to to be helpful. I'm not putting him in the category, I think, yet of some, some of the other guys we mentioned, but he's, like, he's right there, and that's what's been so encouraging. And maybe that's the difference. Maybe it's that we have Randall and you have Tatum, and like even though, yes, T- is Tatum a more gifted scorer than Randall? Probably, sure, yeah. Um, but, you know, in terms of like who is better for, for these teams, um, it's interesting. The, so I want to talk about Kemba real quick. Because the Knicks, again, now at this point, are feeling great. What Whatever happens over the next several days. They've been I, fantastic. They should feel great. Wait, I'm not complaining. Let's just say that. <laughs> I love your, by the way, I love your post game shows after you win. Um, oh God, they're some of my uh, favorite like content to consume in the mornings. Is just uh, I log on, I see the Knicks one, and then I see Jonathan Macri just having like this just, like childish glee, just like is, everywhere across Twitter. And I'm like, I have to watch it because it's, it's been a long time. It's been a long time coming. It's like, you know, when a kid opens that toy you really wanted at Christmas and like, he just feels like he's going to explode in his face. Like, he's just hot containing that like ridiculous amount of happiness. Yeah. That That's exactly what it is, man. Why contain it? Just let it, let it flow. Um, so yes, that is us. That is the next this season. And it's been fantastic. And yet everybody agrees. Um, this is not a roster that is, is, is going to be able to contend for, for a championship. And yet and yet, if you look at like, okay, what's the obvious upgrade? A point guard. Okay, great. What kind of a point guard? A point guard who is going to be able to generate his own offense, but at the same time is going to make life easier for other people and is going to distribute the ball and the whole thing. Um, if you had asked me before the season, like, is Kemba Walker that type of player? I would have been like, yeah. He- I did ask you. 
You and I now I did not want the co- the contract is a different story. Oh yes, which and the knees are also a, a although I guess it's been an oblique. He's he's banged up. Um, whatever. That's a, that's a separate that's a separate issue. But just like in theory, in terms of like what type of player he is, you know, um, it, you would have thought like, but. You see, like him going to the Celtics this year, and again, to your point, there's been injuries. The roster fit is like not ideal with the surrounding pieces. I'm just, I'm thinking, like, are this are this year's Celtics a cautionary tale for how the Knicks should approach their off season in terms of targeting? Because they, I, I mean, obviously they need a point guard because Derek. I don't think they plan on starting Derek Rose next year, and and Alfred Payton. Um, again, the rocket ship, as I have been fond of saying of late, cannot cannot be built fast enough. Um, so I don't know. Do, do you feel like you you still would do the Kemba thing over again? No, for me, I've always felt like Kemba was in this entire rebuild. I feel like everything has been very meticulous. Um, the players that they've acquired, the players that they've targeted, have all been part of look a meticulous team team building plan. Kemba's right. the one exception. To me, Kemba was the panic acquisition. The one where they, yeah, because it was Kyrie left. Yeah. Kyrie went to Brooklyn. Um, Terry Rozier had literally just been on ESPN like and burnt every bridge in Boston possible. Oh, I remember that. That was glorious, by the way. And uh, Yeah, dude, it was amazing. Um, and then that double sign and trade happened. So it was Terry Rozier got signed and traded to Charlotte and they got and Boston got Kemba Walker back to be able to fill some of that scoring that you'd lost when Kyrie left. So I do think that that was... Um, I wouldn't say it was a panic acquisition. I think that's harsh, but I think it was um, an opportunistic ap- acquisition where due diligence kind of went by the wayside in terms of um, how many miles were on the clock, what his actual fit with the team would be. Sure. I just think that that was the one where they acted before they decide before they actually looked at the full roster construction and thought to themselves in the next couple of years, where does he slot in with this? How does the money work? They just went, we need a point guard. We cannot keep Terry now because he's basically walking around with a big FU t-shirt on every day. He's still here. Um, so that was the one mistake in my eyes. I, yeah. Um, it's going to be interesting because I, I, I don't, he has, it's two years left. So it's not like it's a ton of years, but it's 72 mil, 72.5. That's, that's not nothing. To be fair, the final year is a player option, but there's no way you turn down $36 <laughs> million, dollars. 37. What? Sorry. I mean, you uh, never say never nowadays. He's what is he? 30, 31, 32. I mean, he's I, around the, now. I mean, Hayward turned it down and went and signed a, a hundred and something it, million, but that's different. Well, is it though? Hayward was in, had a lot of injury issues over the years, and he then he did. Had, he did. And I mean, you can't even say he had one healthy season because he had injury issues last year too. <laughs> and and um and it's it's been nice seeing him in a very nice suit on the on the bench for the last uh, two months for the for the Hornets. You get what you um, pay for. What's it? <laughs> Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know that I don't, I don't, I don't know that anything Kemba could do over the next however many games the Celtics have left in the season is going to, is going to make that contract any more tradable, especially it's like, where, where's the team, right? Where's the team that's like, oh yeah, give me that. You know, I, I will know, say he, that he's operating more since he's been really good. He's been operating as a two guard, not a one. He's been playing off of Evan Fournier. Um, so then, that, but how does that work? Success, in what sense? Okay, great. So he's he's channeling his inner two two guardness. His in his inner Ray Allen. That's his inner Ray Allen. There you go. Perfect. We we've already talked about Tatum's maybe not so idealized, uh, you know, playmaking. Uh, uh, Jalen Brown's Jalen Brown. He's become made progress as a playmaker, but like, so who's so it's like okay, the Celtics still need a point guard, I guess, at that point. Well, they're looking. They're running it through Evan Fournier when the ball's not in Tatum's hands, coming up. Man, um, they're using Evan Fournier as a distributor. That's a, that's a lot of Fournier for. <laughs> He's my... been excellent, but I will say he this: has been like, good. Uh, He's been good. when I look at the Knicks, I think that one of the biggest disparities between the Knicks and the Celtics at the moment is the Knicks have figured out how to play off of each other instead of with each other. Well, they they do that perfectly. Yeah, and I think that's the a big indicating factor of um team chemistry and team success on a, on a short-term scale, a yes. short to mid-term. Um, 
I think if you look at Boston, they play with each of our paws instead of um, I've just learned what that means. So I thought I'd use it. Um, oh, I <laughs> whereas, you know, they should be playing off of one another and Kemba's figured out how to play off of Evan Fournier. And since those two have kind of figured that out, they're both in the mid twenties to thirties a night type of performances, but it has come from Kemba being an off ball guy. So I don't know how much value he holds going back to being that primary ball handler. Yeah. I think if, the, if, if you p- could pinpoint one difference between the two teams this season from, from what I gather, just from looking at Celtics Twitter, which I occasionally do and just like reading, reading stuff, listening to you and all that is like, there's a lot of Celtics games where the consensus is like, there was a lot of shots that like, that's not, a great shot. That's not the best shot you could have taken on this possession. Whereas with the Knicks, again, knock on wood, that this continues. Very rarely is there a possession where you're like, that was not a good shot. Like the shots may not always go in and there may be some ISOs and things that like it misses, but like you get it. Like if you've been watching this team the whole, the whole season, like you get it, you get the logic, you get the rhythm that they're in, you get what they're going for. Um, And I think the fact that the offense has improved as the season has gone on is, is, is proof of that. Um, a couple more, and then I, uh, I've just been, been told it's it's uh, dinner time. We, you know, we eat early over here. I know you know that from from our old scheduling conversation. It's crazy how early you guys eat dinner. Because it's you know what it's I I don't know if other people with small kids do this, but we like our dinner times usually at like four fifteen or four thirty. It's craziness. What, I don't know what what you eat, and that's a more important question. I think we're having some chicken. I think because my, my mom was here and she brought some. She, Mama Macri brought some chicken. And potatoes. Ah, Mama Macri's chicken. Mama, not chicken cutlets. <laughs> Let me just make that very clear. Um, anyway, so. Um, uh, oh, my God. I forgot his name for a second. Danny Ainge. That, that's talk about speaks volumes. Um, he's been there for a long time. Um, Rozier said what he said. Kyrie couldn't wait to get the fuck out of there. Horford. Kind of maybe couldn't wait to get the fuck out of there. Um, Anthony Davis wanted nothing to do with the situation. Kawhi allegedly did not want anything. Like, I've talked about this before. We've talked about this before. Like, the list of guys is getting a little bit longer of, like, you know what, boss, you know, thanks, but no thanks. Um, At some point, doesn't that have to be a reflection on the guy calling the shots? Yeah, I think so. And the organization as a whole, um, one of the biggest – and I cannot for the life of me remember who told me this or where I read it. Um, but it was definitely from somewhere viable, somewhere where once I acquired this information, whether it was ver- reading or verbal or whatever, it gen- genuinely, I believed it and it struck a chord with me. Was one of the things that, however I acquired this information, was that Boston don't take care of their players in terms of managing their fitness and managing their, um, wow. their health and that apparently like uh, they'll run guys a bit into the ground like they'll kind of put pressure on you a little bit and again i don't know the how much truth is being held in this uh, i don't even remember where I, I read this or whatever but it was very much that they were viewed as a team that would ask you to play through pain more often than not and That's then interesting you, if you look at the injury histories Everything matches up. You have Hayward came back probably too soon from his injuries. Isaiah Thomas playing for a hip injury um, that then pretty much destroyed his career because it, he's That's, never been the same. Um, I wonder how many guys around the NBA look at that Isaiah Thomas situation. Oh, there's a, that's a big factor, dude. The, the, the scars from that deal and that trade and what that what he meant to Boston and everything that happened with the passing of his sister and him still playing, the, those scars are still fresh in terms of um, in the player circles. I'm sure, dude, because Isaiah Thomas's career went from MVP caliber season. He was fifth um, in the voting. Yep, to he's not in the league no more. You know what I mean? So I feel like that had a big part to play. I think that the amount of injuries that guys have sustained there that have been long-term injuries, like not like it's like it's one thing to get hurt. It's another thing to have injuries that last two or three years. Yeah. Um, you know, so I think for there's sure. a lot you don't that want it to part. linger. Yeah, I think there's a lot that plays part to that. Uh, for me, I think that from a Boston standpoint, like uh, it probably is coming to the end of Danny Ainge's tenure, but my outlook on it is, He's or he's he's so far into this job that anybody else that comes in has to start from the beginning. So you might as well wait until this is complete before you know what I mean. Well, no, it'll just be interesting. What does that again? What does that look like? 
what does complete look like? You know, what's the next step? Where's the there's because there's yeah. not a ton of flexibility. I mean, two, three years ago, they were in a position where you could really see a dynasty forming. Oh, yeah, now, I thought it was 100 percent. And now you're in a position where you could see them losing everyone and having to figure well, out a way. I mean, look, um, you know, on one hand, I agree with everything you're saying, and I'm the one who brought it up for a reason. But on the other hand, it's like sometimes you don't know what you got until it's gone. And like there has been a baseline of competence with Danny for a very long time. And I think there is something there is something to that. But the injury stuff is, you know, and, and again, thinking about Tibbs, it's so funny. He came in with this reputation as a guy who drove guys into the ground. And I, look, Julius Randle's leading the league in minutes by a healthy margin. I think by the end of the season, I, if, if RJ isn't number two in total minutes played, he's I'm actually, no, he, I, I'm sure he's number two. I'm going to look it up as I'm talking. Um, but at the same time, at the same time, they are very careful with bringing guys back and not like even right now, we got quickly on the shelf. We got Burks on the shelf. Like Burks was questionable the other day. Uh, or for for the Lakers game, they held him out because it, it didn't he didn't look right before the game, whatever. Um, so like they push guys when it's appropriate to push guys, but they are all like I don't think we're gonna see Mitchell Robinson again this year. Um, you know because of it's a foot thing and it's like that's not something you want to screw around with. So I do think you know with the Knicks there is a feeling like this or and then there's the whole like. Leon Rose, World Wide West, the Kentucky, the CAA, the whole thing where I think players feel like, okay, this is a player or this is a team where like they will have my my best interest. Oh my God, look at this. Julius Randle's first in minutes, obviously. Jokic is leading Barrett by two minutes. By two minutes. Two minutes is the difference. This is going to be that total for the whole season. Total, is total that minutes. Total minutes. So, um, and they have both played 69 games. So that I wonder if, uh, Man, this is going to be interesting. Will Barrett? I wonder. When's, I'm sure I could look this up at some point, I, which I will. Because in terms I'm crazy. of in terms of improvement, how would you say Tibbs has done? Uh, let's exclude Randall from this conversation because it skews the um, yeah skews the discussion. So excluding Randall, how much has Tibbs improved? Guys like Barrett, guys like well, what have you seen from Topping? How it's much? A, where's that improvement coming? It's a, you know it's a tough question to answer because you look at Barrett's improvements and like he's a in a different universe as a shooter he's gotten better as a playmaker um, he's in a bit of a slump in from two point range right now but generally speaking over the course of the season we've we've seen extended segments where he's been very good um, around the rim and 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 with some other stuff um, but like. Barrett's a guy that works his ass off. He, we've we've read interviews with his trainer this season talking about the work that they put in, right? So is like, is that Tibbs or is that what they do in the offseason? Same thing with Randall. Um, you know, same thing, you know, but at the same but then I think so much of it does have to do with putting guys in positions where they can be successful and knowing when to push guys. Like Reggie Bullock needed to be pushed to shoot more. And if you look at how often, and I've talked about this, if you look at how often he has shot it, he is shooting three more threes per game um, since the All-Star break than he was before. He was very hesitant to start the season. And then they, so, someone told him, like, look, dude, you got to shoot fucking ball when you have it. Was that Tibbs? Was that Julius Randle? Um, you know, but I think, I think Tibbs is pushing the right buttons and, and, I'll say this, allowing the improvements that guys make to be put on display and be, be, be used in a way that is, is beneficial to them and the team. Um, you know, he, he's the, you know, he guides the ship and, and, and all the, all the credit in the world to him for that. Um, you see, for me, like that's to me, the biggest advertisement for future free agents that you oh. can have like oh. not not we're not talking this off season maybe not even next like you need a bit of a body of work not just well one you need season. and you need players who are free agents or yeah. or you need someone to demand a trade which is and different. obviously you need money to pay these guys you need cap about cap flexibility yeah, well, but i think that. that you know if, if you draft well if you develop well if you play with a very specific system and structure and you you're successful with the pieces you've got i genuinely believe that's your way to becoming an attractive free agent destination so well, i, I think, think that I think that's de- this year has definitely been good in more ways than one, just in terms of building some uh, 
and I don't like putting it like this, but rebuilding some brand recognition, you know? Oh, and being like, no, that's literally what that is. Absolutely what it is. It is rebuilding brand recognition because the Knicks brand for most of the last 20 years was you guys suck and you're, you're sucking away. That's that's amusing um, and sad, um, <laughs> you know, whereas now it's it's obviously very different. So that so that part has been great. Um, I'm you know what? I'm fascinated to see how the rest of the season goes because, uh, you know, it, it feels like there's a lot riding on the next, whatever it is. What is it going to be? <laughs> it's going to be a week. Is it going to be, you know, for the Celtics? Like that's crazy to say, but like, we're, we're again, we're sitting and recording this on a Wednesday. Um, Bro, I guess the sections, no, the, the sections of Celtics Twitter that are talking draft already. Oh, I'm sure. I mean, look, I, I get it. I totally get it. Um, I want book night. You want who? Uh, book night. Oh, B- book night. James book night from Connecticut. Yeah, I like him too. Um, he's a good player. I, I have, I have not. I know I'm like familiar with all the guys. I've done draft podcasts, but I haven't like really dove deep. Um, yeah. Anyway, I'm enough. <laughs> I'm name. joking. Book I'm night. joking. <laughs> no, it's a great. I know. Uh, I know you know your shit. You know your shit better than better than anyone. You are uh, as good a follow uh, uh, for if in general, but also just specifically for a doing Scott. Doing doing what you do with the Celtics is fantastic. Um, we're gonna, um, as we always do, <laughs> we'll we'll talk again soon. But before I let you go, can you let the fine folks at home know where they could find you and your amazing content? Yeah, man. Well, first of all, thank you for letting me jump on and uh, you know, have these Macri's misgivings about Boston. I've enjoyed them. I just tried to rhyme Macri with something. Um, Macri you guys are looking I like it. You guys are lucky. Macri does a great job. Um, I'm a Celtics guy. I subscribe to Nick's Film School. The the rest of you guys do. Um, he's excellent. So keep supporting him. If you do decide you want to know what's going on in the uh, dumpster fire of Celtics world, uh, you can follow me at Adam Taylor NBA on Twitter. And then I host the Celtics pod for Celtics blog and I write for them too. I try and be as upbeat as possible. This is gave. I'm not, no Celtics fans, I'm assuming, are going to listen to this. So I could have, I can be a bit more candid. How about that? We may have one or two. Yeah, but not enough to come at me with Pitchfork, so I could, I've been able to be a bit more candid. Man, uh, Pitchfork is uh, pitch, Pitchforks are compliments. You know, it takes a lot of effort to get the Pitchfork out of the closet, to raise the Pitchfork. Those things are heavy. You know, yeah, but they hurt. They do hurt. They do hurt. If you if you utilize hurt. it, if you utilize it correctly, it's very true. Um, everybody, go follow Adam. Go go read Adam. Go listen to Adam. He's he's awesome, and um, for as good a content creator as he is, he's an even better guy. So I will I will just end by saying that.